Hello and you're welcome to The Big Tech Show in association with Square. Square helps you look after your business needs from menu management to payments and online ordering. Visit square.com for more. Now, when people talk about quantum computing, they often move quickly to the science fiction area. They start talking about stuff like time travel or multiverses. But what is it actually really all about? What's quantum computing about? And, and can it take into account that science fiction stuff as well as the ordinary computing stuff that experts actually do? Well, to talk about this, I'm joined by Dr. John Gold, who's an associate professor in physics in Trinity College, Dublin. And John, before we get into that, we've just been chatting and we're actually fortunate that you're here with us at all. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess uh, um, two months ago, I had a, a near death experience, which was uh, yeah, unexpected. I, I had a cardiac arrest at a sports event um, and I was lucky enough that there was uh, the right people in the right time uh, to kind of well, you get say me near out of death. That. Well, near death, yeah. Um, I actually died, <laughs> but uh, technically speaking, but I was brought back to life by a defibrillator, you know. For how many minutes? Um, I think a few minutes. Like, uh, you know, it's hard to know because by the time that they noticed that there was something up, I guess there might have been a minute and there was another minute or two after that. So, Do you remember anything about those um, minutes? Yeah, I, I just remember, um, you know, finishing the, the last workout of this competition and, you know, watching my friends and the same team as me kind of finish it. And then I remember getting a kind of, just felt a bit weak and passing out. That's basically it. And then I woke up in, a, in, in an ambulance. So, yeah. I mean, we're <laughs> going to get into quantum computing and physics in, in a few minutes. And I suggested to you beforehand that maybe you did die or maybe this is the last second before you die. And yeah. we're in a simulation right now. Well, I, I guess, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, a lot of people, a lot of physicists kind of were kind of making, making fun of me and telling me that, uh, you know, I was in a superposition, as we say in quantum physics, of being dead and alive at the same time. Like uh, maybe you've heard of Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. cat. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we might. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> slightly baffled, but we, we, we might get into that. Um, just I mentioned in the intro there that when we talk about quantum computing, idiots like me, not intelligent experts like you, we think of things like Marvel movies and we think about things like time travel. Um, in your experience, is there anything you've seen in popular movies, science fiction movies, anything like that that you've thought is a fair depiction of quantum computing? Mm, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I would say, uh, in some ways, reality is almost stranger than fiction. Um, so actually, in practice, quantum physics can even be weirder than what's displayed on TV. But um, you know, obviously, there's um, there's one there's one thing actually which which might be. Like I teach uh, quantum information and quantum computing both at kind of undergraduate and graduate mm -hmm. level. And one of the topics that I teach is um, is quantum teleportation. Teleportation. Yeah. So it's... Uh, this it's, is Star Trek now. Well, it's not Star Trek because uh, what it... Well, you know, what, 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 what quantum teleportation is, it was, it was kind of... It's been around for a while, actually, and there's been experiments, you know, which have fully demonstrated it. Um, Teleporting something from point A to point yeah. B. Yeah. So, so it's not like dematerialization like you see in the movies, like nobody evaporates and reappears somewhere else. But the crucial concept of, of information theory is the idea that you know, what's most fundamental in physics is the information content of, content of something. So like in, in classical computing, um, the, the fundamental unit is the bit. We have a bit of information. And usually that's kind of, you know, represented as a zero and one. It could be an on or off in a circuit or whatever, up or down on some magnetic spin, something like this. And in quantum information theory, in quantum physics, we have something called a qubit. And a qubit forms the kind of primordial building block of a quantum computer in the same way that a bit would, would be the, the thing which forms that building block. And for to get computing. back to the teleportation right. bit. So now the question is, you know, uh, that information can be co encoded in qubits. And a qubit is an abstract notion of a quantum bit with the, of a, sorry, it's an abstract notion of a bit in whereby you encode information in a quantum system. And the difference between a quantum system and a classical system is that something can be both zero and one at the same time. A classical bit is either zero or one. A quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time. So alive and dead at the same time is Schrodinger's cat, zero and one. And that allows you to do different things. And one of the things that you can do, pairing that with measurements, which are very peculiar in quantum mechanics, is you can actually take the state of a qubit 
and you can teleport it to a different location by an adequate measurement scheme. And it's that measurement scheme which has become known as quantum teleportation. But there's no dematerialization of something. Have we come up with an adequate measurement scheme? Have we come up with the device, the process to teleport those quantum, those qubits. Yes, yes. I mean, so that this is a quantum teleportation is actually something that's done routinely in laboratories around the world with photons, which would be, you know, the qubit is encoded in light, for example, polarization degrees of freedom, say, you know, left or right polarized play the role of uh, zero and one. Um, and people have been interested in that for a while. It's actually kind of old news for us at the moment. So. Okay, old news. Okay, so teleportation. That's <laughs> off my list. Time travel. I mean, time travel isn't really something I think that, um, that's, that's really in the scope of, of, of quantum physics per se. It's not something that, you know, I've really thought too much about. I mean, you'd really want to talk with somebody who's an expert in, in kind of gravity or something like that. Well, the National Concert Hall uh, <laughs> played Superman 1 with Christopher Reeve uh, over the weekend, and I, I went to see it, and there's that scene toward the end, and I remember even as a kid watching it, it had me scratching my head, where he's so upset and enraged about the death of Lois Lane that he goes and flies around the world so quickly that you see the Earth, it stops spinning, and then it starts spinning the other way, and it's clear he's going back in time, and he does go back in time. And so this idea has been around for quite a long time, that you can mess with time, that you can maybe pause it in some circumstance, maybe you can speed it up. And I had always understood that there was some element of quantum physics that gave that idea a bit of respect. Yeah, I'm not so sure, really. I mean, I think maybe, I mean, maybe, you know, what what, what I can say is that usually, you know, um, Time travel involves also some component of the theory of gravity, which mm. is very large, yes. you know, kind of, you, you know, massful objects. And uh, one of the interesting things from a fundamental physics perspective is that scientists haven't really cracked how to merge the theory of relativity, which describes large massful objects and gravitation and the theory of quantum mechanics yet. So, so a new so theory may permit it, but so it's you've not actually like... stumbled into the plot of Interstellar there because <laughs> the Christopher Nolan movie, because as part of that movie, that dealt the with these... Christopher Nolan movie. Yeah, I, I didn't know he directed yeah, that. Batman, oh, yeah. um, cool. He's he's uh, he's has the Oppenheimer movie coming up soon. He as does. Well. I'm he actually going to do a panel in IFI on that, I think. Oh. Uh, yeah, for the premiere of it. Okay, because okay, you were saying to me earlier on, you weren't fully across all these science fiction movies, <laughs> but clearly you are. But Oppenheimer's not science fiction, right? No, <laughs> no. Well, there is science in it. I don't yeah, exactly. know how much fiction there will be. One of the plot lines of Interstellar was dealt with these supermassive black holes. Right. So Matthew McConaughey's character, um, they, by skirting these giant black holes with their enormous gravity pulls, they messed with time. Mm -hmm. And at one point, they, they got into a gravity field on a planet, and the gravity was so dense that it actually, I think, a day on that planet equaled something like six months. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 right, like, Again, this is in the realm of somebody who'd be a cosmologist or a gravitational physicist, not really a quantum physicist, but like but large... kind of, they sort of intersect. Don't well, they? I mean, they're very different, right? I mean, mm. uh, like like you know, relativity, which would be what you're talking about here, would be the theory really of of gravity and very large, massful objects. Whereas quantum mechanics traditionally came out of thinking about the smallest objects in the universe. So I know you haven't seen it, but really, what you're talking about there is Ant Man <laughs> <laughs> in the Marvel universe, and also one of the Avengers and the plot of. The last Avengers movie, which, by the way, I can't believe you haven't seen. But anyway, <laughs> call yourself a scientist. Uh, but anyway, um, is, no time. <laughs> is the, the plot is that Thanos has wiped out half the universe. He clicks his fingers. However, they managed to go back in time, partly because Paul Rudd's Ant-Man um, character they have mastered the miniaturization and shrinkage to such a point that he descends to a subatomic level level. Right in the the quantum zone or the okay. quantum arena, okay. and in that way manages to warp time and wow. manages to bend time. Yeah. Let me hit you with another one: the multiverse, the idea of multiverses. I did have someone on a couple of years ago on this podcast where we it was actually a physicist, and we talked in not some depth, but I, I put it to him whether the multiverses could exist and whether it's likely they exist and 
how far we are from exploring any meaningful way of looking at multiverses. Um, in theory, might might it be possible? Um, you know, I guess the idea of the multiverse or the many worlds kind of interpretation of, of quantum mechanics is that you'll never kind of know. Like, so there's this thing about quantum mechanics, right? That's unusual relative to other kind of scientific theories. And it's the fact that the conscious observer, the person making measurements, is very important to the theory. So, for example, you know, you typically expect the moon to exist if you don't look at it. Mm. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, when you have a quantum system in the laboratory, if you're not measuring it, it can be in a different state. And when you measure it, it can appear in a certain state with a complete random randomness. So your act, the act of measuring systems in quantum mechanics is really unusual. Like a butterfly effect, the fact that you, the fact that you're observing it has changed its state. Well, I, I think I think it's more like it doesn't exist until you observe it. Okay. So it can be undetermined, and then you measure, you get an outcome with some probability, and then following the measurement, you've prepared okay. the state. So so like that's. The idea is that people have been really thinking for a hundred years in how to interpret that weird thing about quantum mechanics. And one idea is that before you make a measurement, okay, uh, you know, the system can be in a superposition of many different states. Then you make a measurement, you get an outcome with some probability, but in some other universe, the other thing is happening that you didn't measure. So that's where that kind of, it's, but it's an interpretation. There's not really a way of testing it. Mm. It's just a way that people can reconcile the weirdness in, in their mind. In Spider-Man, <laughs> Spider-Verse, um, they go into this idea of the multiverse in quite a lot of detail. They do in the Avengers as well. In fact, it's becoming a main uh, story arc in most of the DC or Marvel superhero uh, arcs and worlds at the moment. This idea of a multiverse where there are different versions of Superman or mm. Batman or Spider-Man or the Hulk. Um, and sometimes they intermingle through um, portals. Um, and yet it does seem likely to me that the concept of a multiverse could exist. Yeah, um, I mean, actually, I just something's popped into my head now. Do you remember the band called the Eels in the 90s? Yes. So the Nova Kane for the soul. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, Susan's house was one of their yep. hits, right? Mm -hmm. there, the guy, the lead, I think the lead singer or one of them, I can't remember if it's the lead singer, his father invented the Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. There's a great book about it. Wow. He's an unusual guy, a guy called Hugh Everett. Oh. Um, and he went to the US. He studied under um, John Wheeler, which is a famous physicist. So it was wow. the, yeah, there's there's a story about that because I think he was kind of an unusual person. Mm. Um, but, um, There's a guy called Brian Green. I'm not yeah, sure if you know him. He's, yeah, a I do. he's a kind of a populist American scientist and physicist. He's, he's a very good communicator. He does these long podcasts sometimes, his long YouTube videos. He does these TED Talks. He does these Brian Cox stage yeah. presentations as well. And he's quite interesting on the idea of multiverse on, on many worlds. And he would lean more toward believing that that there is definitely something to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I kind of remain in defense. I mean, I'm very much, I'm a, so you're, you always are a something mm. when it comes to interpretations of quantum mechanics. I alternate, I think I alternate between many worlds, but also there's also an element to me like there's shut up and calculate where you yes. just stop thinking about it and just doing it. I would, I would be always encouraging students to do that. They say the following when you study physics that um, if you, if you're interested in the interpretation of quantum mechanics before you're 40, you're a fool. And if you're not interested after 40, you're a fool. Mm. <laughs> so maybe I'm just about on the precipice of getting into that. Like, you know, it's just there must be 40. moments in your life where it occurs to you more than other moments. Like, for example, you've just come through a pretty singular moment in your life when yeah. something could have happened. Yeah. Maybe well, did happen in another universe. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, look, I mean, I don't know if, the, if there's any real meaning to applying ideas of, of quantum mechanics to... Well, no, no, but I wonder all the time what would have happened if had I made different decisions. I remember being in the States and working in uh, Wyoming for a couple of months in 1993, and I was on a phone call with my mother, and my mother was telling me that maybe I shouldn't come back and go to college that because I was getting on very well in the States. Now, it was a, that was a very seminal moment in my life to choose to come back to, to Ireland. My life would be very different. But I'm 
quite sure that there is another reality where I decided not to do that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that I think that's more of the way if you think about it, like it's like there's always these key decisions. Like decisions are interesting, right? But often decisions are not binary, you know, like, you know, black or white or, you know, mm. they can often be multifaceted, like, you you know, so so I think I think, you know, um, you have to kind of there's an interesting thing, like when you think about probabilities, like how does it emerge? Like, so for example, uh, the, the example I always give to students is, you know, the population of Dublin today is whatever it is. It's a number that exists in a singular moment in time. So probably, you, you know, the pro like it's probably around this number. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's because of your ignorance that that probability emerges. Like you just don't know what the number is. You know that it exists. Quantum mechanics probabilities emerge in a very fundamental way. It's not just that you don't know something about the system, like you have ignorance about it. It's really, it fundamentally is random, the outcome of measurements. And I think that's uh, what's very, very difficult to get your head around. Like really probabilities are intrinsic to the theory. Where does religion, if at all, fit into any of this? <laughs> I mean, is, is it just, impossible to link religious I, yeah I, th I think I think you know I, 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 religion is something that works for some people I'm not particularly a religious person um, but you know it's interesting that often scientists are quite dogmatic about being atheist there's also you know maybe maybe that's a bit extreme as well you know um, I think ultimately you know e e let's say uh, you know even any like a good theory like is quantum mechanics a good theory? And what does that really mean? Um, I would say it is. Uh, and the reason for that is that it allows us to make predictions, which you can test from experiments. And furthermore, if an experiment comes along, which doesn't match the prediction of the theory, then there's something up with the theory. So every theory needs to have in it the seeds of falsifiability. Famous philosopher called Karl Popper always talked about falsifiability. You can make up a theory, but if it's not testable or falsifiable by experiment, it's not a good theory. Mm. So, I mean, religion <laughs> isn't a theory, right? It's a belief. Um, so, uh, do you see what I mean? I, I see what you well, mean. In science, we don't believe. We construct theories to see if they... But there's also an element of sometimes you get very kind of very high-level theories which there's no way of testing them. You need energies beyond the scale of what's possible on Earth. Are they a theory if they can't really make predictions about experiments? Are they a belief? Okay, I'm going <laughs> to just park the, the theoretical stuff and the superhero stuff that I've been piling on you. <laughs> it's for, okay. For a moment. Um, will quantum, does that have any role in giving us supercomputers? Sometimes I hear about that. We're going to get supercomputers because of quantum. IBM keep messing around with this. Yeah, so I would I do a bit of work on that myself. So, you know, one of the things that's changed, you know, quantum mechanics is 100 years old, but one of the things that's changed in the last couple of decades is that, you know, scientists in laboratories worldwide have been able to isolate individual quantum systems in the laboratory for kind of time scales, which would have been unprecedented, say, you know, a couple of decades ago. And what I mean by the time scales is that quantum phenomena is fra fragile, you know, to make a superposition or an entangled state, you know, and make that state live for a long time, it's, it's difficult, right? They have to typically cool things down, isolate them very well. And so what people realize is that if they use these quantum systems as the building blocks for logical operations, like in computer science, there are certain algorithms, you know, that you can construct which offer speed up over known classical counterparts. Like there's an example, like searching through a database can be made faster if you employ a quantum algorithm. The problem is on the hardware side is that these devices are being built now largely in the multinational companies like IBM that you mentioned, Google, there's also activity in, in various different startups. And, um, you know, there's a big Could challenge. Google use quantum to make their own email searchable properly. <laughs> they could do that. The world would, you know, would owe quantum yeah. a big favor. The reality is that I think, you know, quantum computing is coming. Um, it's already, there's already very impressive proof of principles by various research groups and industries worldwide, but it'll be very, very targeted in terms of the type of problem that it'll be applied for. So what, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. What does it look like? So, I mean, so it, it will go hand in hand with advances in standard supercomputing, I guess, I, I would imagine. But is it um, in a box? 
Well, Thank it's you. in. If you've seen, it depends on the, what. At the moment, the thing is that they don't really have a universal hardware platform for it. There's various different hardwares, like the old days in computing before the transistor. With the big tapes. People did, yeah, vacuum, va vacuum tubes, mechanical things. Then a transistor came along, and everything went kind of electronic. So what are we waiting for? for the well, we're waiting. Computer. The problem at the moment is that these devices that they're building are either made from superconductors, they're made from ions, where they make the qubits out of atoms which are trapped. Um, and, and photons are another platform, but there's problems like with, building a nuclear bomb or something. Uh, well, it's not really, but it's, it's just about controlling these highly uncontrollable systems and keeping the noise level down because the noise that's around the laboratory, just basic stuff like air molecules interfere with these very fragile states that they need to do, to do things. Not make them explode. Or no, 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 no. They, they collapse their wave function is the technical mm. thing. So um, what do you tell your friends that you do? Um, well, I, I guess that's, that's, that's uh, you know, I, I just say I'm a physicist and then they, they think I said, they think I mean physician. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, yeah, I just say I'm a scientist and mm. often I get annoyed because they think I'm just a teacher, but actually teaching is, although it's an important part of my job, like it's very much a small percentage of my, my kind of driving. 10 years time, what would you like to see? We're, we're chatting again. And you're saying, do you remember that time we had yeah. chatted in that podcast? And I, mean, I was trying to explain to you all of the things that quantum could do and the formative stages that they were at. Mm -hmm. It's 10 years time from here. What is it that you would hope uh, to see quantum having had achieved that we are starting to see in our own ordinary lives in ordinary society? Yeah, I, I, I guess you'd like to see you know, there's this thing called fault tolerance quantum computing, universal quantum computing. That's the idea where they could build machines that are able to correct the errors that occur. That still seems to me, if I'm a betting person, quite a long way off. It could be almost two decades, right? But you never know what happens technologically. Does this go hand in hand with advances in artificial intelligence? Everything, you know, it goes with, with everything. Advances in material science, different things like that the possibility that someone comes up with a new great idea for a hardware platform. But in the meantime, what I'd like to see, given that they have these devices now, but they're a bit noisy, is you'd like to see even those devices, the so-called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices or NISC devices, you'd like to see them supplementing some calculations that can't be performed on, say, supercomputing architecture, you know, a comp complex problems. You'd like to identify classes of complex problems in which the world's most super, super computer can't tackle. So that system and that achievement with AI, advances mm -hmm. in AI, we are kind of talking about the Terminator, aren't we? <laughs> aren't we? No. <laughs> well, we're talking about something that's way closer and more powerful than... Now, just to put this in context, I do not... I'm not one of the scaremongers on AI. I think we're going way over the top in getting freaked out about it. But the type of advanced computing that you're talking about, together with the type of advances, uh, advances that I expect to see in artificial intelligence in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. That is something. Yeah, I mean, AI is a different. Like AI is interesting. You know, you have to be not but interested in the direction um, that it's taking. My issue with AI is the following: like, I would have thought that we could kind of all stay at home and not work, and the computers would do the work for us. But it seems that we're working more and more, despite all this stuff, right? You know, um, well, that might yet happen. Yeah, like you know, even if you go to a bank nowadays, it's not connected to AI. Like, but there's no people in banks anymore. Mm. I think Karl Marx made the right prediction when he said that you know one day even the machines would run the capitalists themselves. <laughs> that seems mm. to me what's happening. But um, it's an interesting point, I think, with, that, with those type of advances. AI's been, it, it's interesting because AI's been around as a concept for quite a long time. Like people have been working on it, I don't know, 80s, 70s. I, I'm not an expert in computer science, but it, the idea of AI has been around a while. What changed is just that we have faster processors and more compute power available. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things is like I've seen is these deep fakes, you know, where you can kind of make you know, an actor dies, right? Uh, and you can, if you want, you can use AI to keep them alive forever doing the mm. same thing. It's, it's kind but of married with the kind of quantum computing power that may arrive in the yeah, next decade. Yeah, it, it, it may. Like there's lots of people working on quantum artificial intelligence and stuff like that. But I would say quantum computing itself, again, it seems to me that, you know, it'll address topics which are relatively niche in the sense that it, it won't be useful in many th many problems. But in certain problems, it will be the best thing we have. So I envisage a kind of situation where if you're 
if you have very hard problems to solve, you know, there might be certain parts of that problem which are portable across to a quantum architecture and that provides a speed up. But, um, but yeah. I think we have the plot for the next couple of Marvel movies. Uh, in, in <laughs> Dr. John Gold, Associate Professor in Physics at Trinity College, Dublin. Thank you very much for coming and talking us today. And that's all we have time for on the Big Tech Show uh, this week in association with Square. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in, for watching or for listening. Thanks also to Tabitha Monaghan, who produced to Gav Hennessy on sound and Conan Doherty on video. And we'll be with you the same time next week. Bye bye. 